here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 20, there are a couple names that I want you to take note of. Among these are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan. These are strong words. No longer are these two guys underneath the umbrella of protection within the local church. They've been handed over to the world so that the world can destroy the flesh and perhaps prompt them to repent and come back to the one true God. So the goal is reconciliation here. Now, when it comes to us, I, I want you to know that this is no small issue when it comes to addressing the Southern Baptist Convention. It's the largest Protestant denomination on the planet. It was originated in 1845. There's nearly 50,000 churches today with nearly 14 million in membership. Now, today I'll expose some of the gross attempts of the SBC elites to keep the Southern Baptist Convention large, which has become the idol, bigness, largeness, numbers. So among these issues, church growth and the size of a local church has become the main goal, and you do not see that in Scripture. Now, on the flip side, attendance in the Southern Baptist Convention over the last 14 years has dropped 27%. And so now the pragmaticians, the magicians, the con artists are scrambling to try and trick people into coming inside of our churches to try and build back up the church's size and the growth. And so that is not trusting God. Matthew 16, 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So how big the church is and how it grows is God's prerogative and we're simply to be obedient and trust him with the results. And we see all throughout scriptures that this world will wax worse and worse and wear out like a garment. We should expect nothing else than for the church of Christ, the true believers to become narrower and narrower, fewer and fewer as that day comes closer. And so the Southern Baptist Convention is fighting against the logical ideas that Scripture sets out for us. Now, let me clarify. When I say the SBC elites, I don't mean the people in the pews. By and large, I believe that our people in the pews are God honoring, God fearing, Bible carrying, God loving, Jesus loving, Jesus believing conservatives. I believe that they love the local church and I believe they love Christ. And I don't think that mo the majority of them actually know what's going on. In fact, it takes years to peel back the onion layers of deception. It takes years to pull back the curtains to be able to see what's going on. When I say SBC elites, I'm talking about the presidents of all the major entities, especially the seminaries, especially the North American Mission Board, especially the International Mission Board, especially the Executive Committee, especially the trustees on all of these entities, the provosts at the seminaries. I'm talking about the SBC elite such as the Elite megachurch pastors who have a voice and they have influence within the convention. I'm talking about those who are even behind the scenes, who have influence, those who we do not know about, those who publish stuff that Lifeway will sell and without any convictions to the scriptures, they'll simply put it all out there. I'm talking about the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, who deals with public policy when it comes to the Southern Baptist Convention and their capitulation on abortion and their capitulation in all areas when it regards to the true gospel. I'm not talking about the people in the pews. I'm not talking about individual churches. I'm talking about, by and large, those who control the millions and millions and millions of money on our behalf. All of these monies are now being directed in a way that we would not approve of. I'm talking about the SBC elites, such as the Sin Relief, the Baptist Press, the Credentials Committee. I'm talking about these guys who control where our missions giving and sending goes and how they use it. It's simply been hijacked. The power is no longer in the people's hands. It's in their hands and the microphone has been turned off to the people and they're doing exactly what they want to do. I'm telling you today that it's time for another Protestant Reformation. The same way the true Christians came out from underneath the Catholic Church and 
started practicing biblical Christianity with a true gospel is the same thing that needs to happen today. We who are true believers need to come out from underneath the Southern Baptist Convention umbrella and have a new reformation to stand upon what is true. The only way to be able to make your mark and to stand against what is true is to leave now. The die has been cast and there's nothing that we're gonna be able to do save God stepping in and reviving the whole thing. Charles Spurgeon fought the same kind of battle in his day, and he called it the great downgrade, two words, downgrade of the Baptist Union in England. That was in the late 1800s and early 1900s, so there's nothing new underneath the sun. And most who knew Charles Spurgeon best said that he died of a broken heart because of all of this. He died in anguish because of this downgrade. Folks, I'm just telling you, this liberalism, this false gospel that's being propitiated through critical race theory and all this, what I will explain to you today, is very disheartening. And it harms people. It separates families. It's tragic. And so that's one example on how this downgrade is happening in our example, in our time, and it's nothing new. So last week we discussed how Pilate said, the phrase, what is truth, right? And that was simply demeaning as to the value of truth. He downplayed truth when he said in John chapter 18 and verse 38, what is truth? He simply made it as if it was not even something that could be ascertained or valuable. And today, the elites in the SBC are downplaying truth. They're making it relative. And so... I want you today to not be afraid of names. Historically, the culture in the SBC has put friendships above Scripture. But today, I want to give you an example in the fact that we need not to be afraid of calling out those who are grossly against God and the gospel. So don't be afraid of names. And in this, we've already named in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Hymenius and Alexander. Now turn to chapter 5, if you would, in 1 Timothy. Chapter 5. In verse 19 and 20, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Now, we have met for years on these subjects that which I'm going to share with you today, and nothing has been accomplished. Witness after witness after witness has stood at the microphone at these conventions. Phone call after phone call after phone call has been made to these SBC elites, email after email after email, and all of these collaborative efforts have come in to, uh, to, 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 to just nothing is being accomplished. In verse 20, it says, those who continue in sin... Rebuke in the presence of all. All right? So there it is. Do not be afraid of standing against those who continue in sin. And there's a very important reason that we do this, so that the rest will also be fearful of sinning. This is for our own good, folks. This is for church health, so that we too will not be drawn in to sin and will actually be afraid of sinning, will be afraid of a holy and righteous God, which is the beginning of wisdom. If you're not convinced already, then continue to listen because I'm going to go through the rest of Timothy here in 2 Timothy, and I'm going to show you exactly where there are more names that are listed. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 1, and verse 15, you'll also see another name mentioned, another two names. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 15, you are aware that the fact that all who are in Asia turned away. So here we go. We've got two names that are being listed of those who turned away from me, pretty much the faith, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So these two have been called out. Now what I'm doing today, when I name names, it's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on the internet. It's going to be there forever. But it's nowhere near close to being in God's word for eternity. And so... May I rest my case? Nevertheless, I want to keep going. Chapter 2, verse 17, and their talk will spread like gangrene. And so the next two individuals that are called by name are called out for their gossip in the church. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus. So these two have been called out by name so that the rest will be fearful of doing the same things. Their 
garbage spreads like cancer, like gangrene. It must be called out. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 and following, reveal that Janus and Jambres were opposed to Moses and the truth. And so for those who oppose the truth, they get called out by name. 2 Timothy 3.8, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. There it is, very clear. Men of a depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. So look up, folks. Just as their folly was evident to all, we will see folly before our eyes as the years unfold. Verses 10 and following. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and perseverance, persecutions and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live in Christ will be persecuted. There's a promise for you. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. There's another promise for you. Those who are evil. Do they, do they wear the word evil on the front of their t-shirt? No, they're masquerading as angels of light, the Bible says. And so when you hear someone who is really smooth in talking and just is so winsome like a Rick Warren, beware, you need to pay attention as to what they're actually saying and compare it to Scripture, that which we'll do here in just a moment. But the Southern Baptist Convention here, according to verse 13, is my comparison. They're moving from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, in Titus chapter 1, if you flip over to Titus, it's just another page or two, most likely, in your Bible. I want to read verses 9 to 14, and you will see how the Bible instructs pastors specifically to rebuke those leaders and who are opposed to God publicly and even severely, and at the same time, hold fast in the faith, hold fast to the Word of God. Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, holding fast to the faithful word. You, you get the context here, correct? That this is to Titus, and he's instructing elders to do this in the local church. Holding fast to the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort sound doctrine. That's one thing that must be being done by pastors, exhorting sound doctrine, which has been compromised in the Southern Baptist Convention and to refute those who contradict it, which does not happen in the Southern Baptist Convention, most commonly known as the 11th Commandment. Verse 10 and following, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Folks, you could just write a little dash and put CRT at the end of that phrase there at verse 11 because the whole reason why critical race theory is being embraced is to continue to win the world. And you cannot partner with the world and not be hostile towards God. James 4.4 4 is what that verse is. Verse 12 one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely. I think this verse has been forgotten in Southern Baptist life that those who are in authority have to be held accountable. And when they step out of line, they must be reproved severely so that they may be sound in the faith. It's not that we're trying to do anything else than what is good for them and their soul. Verse 14, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. And so that was what was happening in their day and what's happening in our day is the same thing, a turning away of the faithfulness and the fidelity of God's word. So when it comes to reproving, verse 13 in Titus 1, who are we reproving? I've mentioned already it's the SBC elites. Now I'm going to get just a little bit more specific, kind of biblical. So hang on here. I'm going to share with you some of the details about Ed Litton, J.D. Greer, James Merritt, Tony Evans, Rick Warren, Kevin Ezell, Johnny Hunt, and more. Even the current president, Bart Barber. Uh, who publicly approved of Rick Warren and his ordaining of women in the Southern Baptist Convention and said that homosexuality will not send you to hell. 
This is terrible, folks, that we have now had four presidents that have not only downplayed homosexuality, but endorsed it. James Merritt endorsed his homosexual son's sermon and called it faithful to the gospel, which it was anything but. And then last season's uh, president, J.D. Greer, said that homosexuality will not send you to hell. And then Ed Litton plagiarized that sermon and said the same thing, homosexuality will not send you to hell, and now Bart Barber. Now, our particular line in the sand has been as a church is homosexuality. As soon as you cross that line, we're out. And folks, that day is today. We have decided a long time ago that there's no other reason why God rained down fire, hell, and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah was except for homosexuality. And there's no other reason why God would turn a human being over to a depraved mind in Romans chapter 1 except for homosexuality. And we're just simply not willing to be tolerant in this area. We're not going to tolerate that which is an abomination unto the Lord. And this is the direction, mark my words, this is the direction of the SBC. And so the SBC president now is affirming in this area, he's a lukewarm, moderate, at very best. He's tolerant. Revelation 3.16 says this, because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Folks, I don't know about you. I, actually, I do know you. But we are not willing to be there on judgment day with those who are going to be spit out of Jesus' mouth in that way. Rick Warren is given to gross boasting, and I am so disheartened at the majority of those who stood and gave his self-exaltation speech a round of applause. A, stand, a, a standing ovation, it was Gross. I was no more than 20 feet away from him when he stood and took the floor because Ed Litton gave it to him, which was a breach in parliamentary procedure. That was awful in itself, but Rick Warren shunned sound doctrine. He bashed conservatives as disunifying. He personally played the role of the victim and just simply won the entire room to himself when he played the role of the victim when he first got the microphone. Listen to me. What's popular today is to play the role of the victim and add up intersectionality points. And so you are more victimized or more disenfranchised by all of these different community and cultural and country type fabric with things. And if you can do that, then everybody else will bow to you and give you money and power. Here, that is the crave of the day in our world. Our world is just begging for something to, 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 to advocate for or someone for. They want to be aggressive in this area. So Rick Warren knows this. And he comes out and he plays the role of the victim. And now everybody's eating out of his hands. And he goes on to boast of planting 98 churches in California and being mentored by Billy Graham and how he did a massive amount of preaching even before age 20 how he baptized 56,000 people and sent 26,000 on missions and has 76,000 members in his church and has 9,000 Bible studies and he's planted thousands of churches and trained 1.1 million pastors for which he boasted that that is more, it's false information by the way, that that is more than all of our six seminaries combined. And then he gets a standing round of applause now, if you're going to talk about a gross sense of idolatry here in idolizing numbers and numbers being the end game which justifies any of the means, this is a complete abandonment from the scriptures. And if you say the right things and you go after the numbers, then basically in the Southern Baptist Convention, you can do whatever you want. Rick Warren called for a unity and ignored scriptural sufficiency and received a standing ovation applause for this. We've got to stand against this, not stand for it. Now, forget the fact that Rick has already partnered with Muslims and is uh, proposing a theological principle that unifies both Christians and Muslims. He's done workshops to this means. He's, according to secular media, not our media, Secular media, he's deemed as America's pastor. Now, the only way that you're going to get that name from secular media is, this, is if they know that you're a universalist, if they know that you are for all of the faiths. So this is a fact. 
Rick Warren is a universalist. Now, Ed Litton gave Rick the floor, and any amount of time that he wanted to speak, he had that. And then Litton left his moderation duties and started applauding and amening Rick. Now, this is not the job of a moderator, especially at a Southern Baptist convention. He's to remain neutral and keep parliamentary procedure in place, and he's got experts beside him to see that this happens. Now, Ed Litton abandoned his duties there and cut off the parliamentary procedures. He cut off good men like Tom Buck when they were at the microphone asking good, solid questions. He cut them off and moved on, and he completely ignored the messengers and parliamentary procedures, especially when they were asking about plagiarism, for which he is guilty of, especially when he was asked about women pastors, which he is guilty of doing as well. So Ed Litton has not only lied, he's smirked about it while he is getting away with these things. He himself has removed over 100 plagiarized sermons from his church website, and he changed his heretical doctrinal statement on the Trinity back to what conservatives in the Southern Baptist Convention would approve of as he was running for president. How mischievous was that? He had his wife as a co-pastor before, and he changed the title on that when he was being considered as president. He said that homosexuality will not send you to hell. And also, he's partnering with this worldly urban initiative here with Tony Evans. Evans called a unifying project. So this um, Unify project is championed by uh, not only Ed Litton, but by Tony Evans. Now, if you're going to bring in an outside guy to advise a Southern Baptist convention, it should not be Tony Evans, who is completely woke. And this is a woke initiative. And Ed Litton had these um, put in every seat. And there was 12,000 people in the room. Everybody got one of these. And so what's going to be happening is communities are going to be receiving millions of our missions money to this woke agenda. And un told amounts of church volunteer hours are going to be going towards this woke racial reconciliation agenda, which by the way is another important reason for us to leave the SBC is because this is making racial relations worse. You do not play in and give someone a victimhood mentality and then bow down and repent of your whiteness or repent of what you do not know. This is making things way worse. So, SBC elites have covered for him in all of these areas rather than calling him out. Proverbs 28, 13 says, one who conceals his sins will not prosper. Folks, this has been covered up and it's not prosperous in God's mind. God wants to bless us. God wants to help us. He does not want to harm us. But if we're partnering with these initiatives, we're going to be on the unblessed side of things. We just simply cannot do that. So not only are the SBC elites concealing sin, they're promoting it. Lytton is our first example of how they're promoting this type of sin as he was invited by all of the seminary presidents to chapel. Now, keep in mind, if you are a student at one of our theological seminaries, for which there are nearly 40,000 students, if you combine them all, then who speaks in chapel is your example. And you look up to whom the seminary president brings in to preach in chapel. You listen closely to what he says. They are our example. But yet Jamie Dew at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary invited Ed Litton and all of these things that were known to speak. Danny Aiken at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary did the same thing. Al Moeller at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary did the same thing. Adam Greenway at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary did the same thing. They all brought Lying Lytton in as an example in chapel. Get this. Any one of those theological students, if they were to have plagiarized even a paragraph on a research paper, they would be removed from the seminary. Yet, hundreds of sermons have been plagiarized by Lytton And a gross abandonment of our Baptist faith and message and biblical convictions was on display. I like what our newest member, Matthew Story, said, to permit is to promote. And we can no longer permit these things. To do so would simply to be promoting it. So, strangely enough, 
Even our messengers, by overwhelming majority, approve of Ed Litton. They trust him. He's a liar, but they trust him. It's strange. Even after he brought Tony Evans into our convention meeting to partner with us on this woke initiative, they trust him. It's a social justice urban initiative, that which I've been preaching against for years now. This is no new news for us. This is what the world is doing. It's being brought into the church. And we stand against this. We want to keep the bride of Christ holy. So social justice is being brought in. And there even was a woke video that not only the people in the room, 12,000 plus people saw, but those who are watching online, they saw. And those who will ever click onto this website and see this woke video that demonstrated that whites don't know that they're racists. And they demonstrated this poor old man bowing down and apologizing and repenting as an example of what we should do. That's just a shame. So the previous president, J.D. Greer, promoted social justice as well, and especially through the Sin Network and the Church Planting Network. And he also said that homosexuality won't send you to hell. Lifeway publishes all kinds of anti-biblical material. It's non-Trinitarian, self-help, pragmatism, that is attractional and heretical, folks, I'm telling you. All of that is bad. But attractional worship is the thing of the day. It used to be called contemporary or whatever. You know that we do biblical lyrics and music here that's focused upon God. But this attractional thing is seriously spitting in the face of God. Because Jesus Christ needs nothing other than his good name to attract people into him. We don't need the glit, the lights and the glitter and the glamour. We don't need all the tricks and the gimmicks. And we don't need a professional on stage with the perfect voice and, the, and to, to wow and to entertain you and to draw you through entertainment. We don't, we, don't, we don't do any of that. And Christ doesn't need that. But to do so means that you believe you need to add something to his light. Kevin Ezell, president of the North American Mission Board, he hides millions and he will not be accountable for the budget. He just simply ignores messengers and when messengers ask about the mishandling of millions of funds, he just gives them a glazed over answer, a stereotype answer about, oh, we believe in the gospel, we believe in planting churches and he, and he smiles and he ignores the question and says a bunch of false garbage because he's not doing what he says he's doing and he ruins church planters' lives. I'm telling you by firsthand testimony that funds have been removed by him and put onto another church planter right in the same neighborhood because Kevin Ezell liked someone better and, they, and this church planter wasn't getting the numbers. This is where our Annie Armstrong Easter offering has been going, but it's not going to be going in that direction anymore. Brian Wright oversees disaster relief as a sin president, and he is buddies with Kevin Ezell, and you could expect the same ministry philosophies that will be happening with millions of dollars in this direction. And what is happening is more of a humanitarian approach to the gospel and leading people in a, a cheap sinner's prayer and adding social justice to that at the same time. This is awful on top of awful on top of awful. And when the time is right, when our church decides to have a, a business meeting, we will discuss where our missions giving money will go as a church. And as you see, it's my recommendation that we no longer do Annie Armstrong offering or even Lottie Moon, and I'll explain. Vance Pittman is over church planting now. Church planting, I've looked at it, is just simply a burn-out job description. A man and his family have gone through theological education. They have debt. Now they're planted in a strange city, and they're expected to find a house and find a job and plant a church with minimal support, maybe $800 a month. And that's too much pressure on a man. But yet they're planting these over and over and over and over again. The result is burnout. They are burning good, called men of God out the marriages aren't making it. The children are bitter towards God. The, the churches are shallow, attractional, at best going to survive a year or two. It is a destructive plan. 
And so the budget has grown for the church planning network from 23 to 75 million dollars. So think about that. Yet this whole process is woke and it supports women pastors. If that wasn't bad enough, we've all been deeply stung by Johnny Hunt covering up his own sexual advances towards a woman some 20 years ago. And he was at the North American Mission Board as the head over evangelism. He has um, been convicted of abusing a woman and the SBC elites covered it up. Now you tell me, what, how, how does that true uh, woman feel about that? In the last 20 years, how does her and her husband feel about being shunned and put aside and having been asked to keep it silent. So Johnny, he didn't come clean when he was asked about it, but Guidepost, a third party entity, investigated and interviewed those who were involved. They found out the facts, and they came back and interviewed Johnny, and they asked him, and he denied it. They uh, leaned in a little bit more and gave him a little bit more details, and he confessed a little bit more. And then they gave him a little bit more details, and he confessed a little bit more, and so on and so forth. The man did not come clean from the very beginning, and the SBC covered it up. Ephesians 5.3 says, Immorality must not be named among you. And then in 1 Timothy 3.1, an overseer must be above reproach. Yet at the same time, Johnny Hunt's belittling this and calling it consensual, and I'm disgusted by it. Paul Chitwood is at the International Mission Board. I originally, I have really, truly enjoyed and appreciated Paul Chitwood. Um, however, the fact that he promotes that thousands die every day and go to hell without the gospel puts the weight on the people for salvation. And you and I know that it is not in our hands as to whether or not someone repents and places their faith and trust in the gospel. John 6, 37 says, all those the Father gives me will come to me. And our confidence in the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is in God. It is not in our winsomeness. It is not in even our obedience. It is not in our ability to travel somewhere. It's not in our ability to share the gospel. It's not in our ability. It's in Christ, in Christ alone. And somehow between the faithfulness of the gospel being shared and preached, Conviction sets in, but it's a holy, a work of God. And when our entire mission's philosophy of soteriology and salvation puts the weight on the people, then here's the result. You get really scared. And you're like, I don't want to mess it up. And you're, you're scared in the silence. And you don't want to bridge that conversation because you're, you're afraid that you might not do it right. And so there's this unhealthy fear that lingers over the believer. And this is part of Southern Baptist culture. But yet, go, 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 share, share, share. All the weight's on you. People are dying going to hell because you're not sharing. That's wrong. And we can no longer partner with this erroneous, erroneous philosophy. Whatever happened to good old famous verses that we love in Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Listen to verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren and these whom he predestined he also called and these whom he called he also justified and these whom he justified he also glorified the process has already been and we are just obedient we are enjoying the journey we're Christians who share the gospel and God works it all out and so now to see this happening is against biblical soteriology. James Merritt, the former SBC president, publicly endorsed his homosexual son's sermon as a faithful exposition to the gospel when there wasn't anything faithful about it. Yet he's still an influential pastor in Georgia. He's still in the game and he is still doing his thing. Now when I ask predominant pastors, I'm gonna move now from the elites to some predominant pastors. When I ask pastors, I'm, I'm very grateful for their time to be able to talk with them, but what I found is that none of them, save Steve, Steve Gaines at Bellevue, are willing to talk about the hard facts. 
None of them are willing to discuss these things that I've laid out. And believe me, there's a whole lot more. But Steve Gaines and I spoke, and we were shocked together as how the entire room, it seemed, did not know what the definition of a pastor was and how this became an issue. And I asked Steve Gaines his thoughts on this as we were sitting there, and and he said, I was on the committee that updated the Baptist Faith Message 2000, and there was none, none of us misunderstood what a pastor was. It's a man. There was no confusion there at all. This is ridiculous. Yet, there is mass confusion as to what a pastor is, and a lot of it stemming from Rick Warren ordaining three women as pastors, as he is, by and large, the example for most Southern Baptists. However, I was disappointed in Steve Gaines as he promoted Ed Litton, did his integrity and character. Al Brumbach is the new pastor of First Baptist Naples, and as I spoke with him, he ignored the facts about First Baptist Orlando and their woke agenda and baptizing homosexuals and placing the LGBTQ people into service, and he defended his friendship with David Youth, saying that he's known him for over 10 years. I didn't say how long I had known David because the conversation is just null and void at that point. I know where he stands. You're not going to change his mind. And so he moved on after that. There's another pastor who has influence not only in our state, but also in our convention who is simply tolerant and unwilling to say anything or to do anything to stand upon righteousness. He is putting his friendship above the scriptures. That which I just will not do. I'm appreciative of the conversation uh, with Dr. Tommy Green. He is the Florida Baptist Convention treasurer, a.k.a. president. He basically said that there's nothing that I can do. As we talked about everything, I aired out all of these facts. And I thanked him for 45 minutes on the cell phone. And you can imagine how many calls and how much is taxing on his time. He gave me 45 minutes on the phone. I was grateful for that. But here's the facts. He told me there's simply nothing that he can do. Now, I disagree with that, by and large. I I say you should utilize your influence to say, not in this house, not in our convention. Stand up for righteousness. And so what if you lose your job? God is in control. Our own association director, Dr. Tom Chaney, has been very gracious with his time with me as well and is um, the director for the Greater Orlando Baptist Association. He said he's remaining neutral. And um, again, I disagree with remaining neutral and being tolerant. But however, keep this in mind that our churches here in Central Florida, we hold the, the power, okay? What we say is what happens at GOBA. Dr. Tom Chaney, or the director of GOBA, is just simply the director. He is to direct what the churches vote to do in regards to the three initiatives of church planting, um, church revitalization, and leadership training. Those things which I'm involved with in church leadership training. And we've hosted seminars here. So we still have a voice with our association. And my encouragement to us is to stay engaged. I was disappointed as I spoke with Cam Triggs, a North American Baptist or a North American um, missions board um, church planter, right over here beside of us. He's a neighbor, and as I spoke with Cam, um, over he's right here in Pine Hills. He was the pastors conference vice president, and so he was interacting with all of the pastors there, and I asked him, you know, was that a heavy position to hold? He said, yes, it was very taxing. It required a lot of me and traveling and interacting, you know, and days and days and days of work. And then I transitioned over into talking to him about his picture that was in the messenger's book. And in his picture, there was a backdrop. And in the backdrop, it said, do justice, preach grace. And so I asked him, could you I I, I sincerely tell me what it means to do justice. What am I to do? I I, want to know what you are expecting for me to do when it regards to doing justice. And I was very disappointed in his answer. There wasn't any scriptural basis for it, and it seemed very ambiguous. And then a transition of subjects, and he said, thank you for letting me know in regards to everything that's going on. But I got the clear sense that he was not willing to do anything about it, and so I don't expect anything to come of 
Cam Triggs, who is very connected with our Florida Baptist Convention and the North American Mission Board. If there's anyone that could get anything done, it would be Cam, David Youth at First Orlando, Alan Brumbach at First Naples, these guys whom I was enabled to be able to have conversations with, but yet at the same time, none of them are willing. They're all capitulating. And at the same time, now we move from the SBC elites down from the pastors, now down to, and by the way, Steve Gaines is at Bellevue in Tennessee. I was just enabled to have a conversation with him, and I hope to hear back from him. He said he would call me. But now let's move down to the messengers in the room. I was disappointed in the fact that uh, Tom Askall and Vody Bauckham were willing to take on this effort in trying to change and turn the direction of the Southern Baptist Convention. I was encouraged that they were willing to take on this monumental task. Vody Bauckham is in Africa, and he is overwhelmed with all that God has for him over there. I mean, lostness is... Yeah, can you imagine... And yet he's still willing to come over and to participate in this denomination. I appreciate him. He is Southern Baptist educated and he planted a church for the Southern Baptist Convention. And so he knows it well. But uh, the messengers overwhelmingly voted them down. Now at first it looked like they may have won. But when it come to the ballots, it looks like perhaps that the liberals had control of the parliamentary system and steered it in the direction that they wanted it to go. And so in your bulletins, I have given you the percentages that came out in the first um, elections, and then there was a runoff, and Tom Askall lost by a great percentage. So there's just simply a spirit, by and large, with the messengers, and I'm not talking about the people in the pews. Keep in mind that there's only 7% of the Southern Baptist Convention churches represented at this annual meeting, totaling about 12,000 people. But those people that come that are messengers, that are delegates, that are representatives of all of the churches, they are the ones that are able to call for change. They're the ones that are able to do it. You only have, we only have a certain amount of messengers that we're able to send from our church. So they are the ones who count, and there's the ones who are taking time out of their schedule to go. And they overwhelmingly tolerate all of this stuff. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, What does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? I just see it very clear. By majority, overwhelming majority in the room, that everyone seems tolerant of even the ERLC's approach to redefining pro-life and making abortion tolerable. So the majority is okay with immorality and engaging in social justice and engaging in pragmatism. The majority of the messengers are okay with it. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Therefore come out from among their midst and be separate. This is where we're at and wasting effort with complacent pastors is no longer my thing. I want to stand with those of you who want to stand. I want to make a difference. I want to be known for those of us who stand for truth. And I appreciate the fact that we've remodeled this building. And some time ago, we even put a Bible right here underneath the pulpit. So I'm literally standing on the Word of God. And we are living it out as a church. And we're known for that. And I congratulate you for that. But in the SBC culture, pastors are shunned for standing for holiness. But yet they're accepted when they accept homosexuality. <coughs> Paul, the apostle, influenced Peter when he shrunk back from the purity of the gospel. None of these pastors seem willing. The purity of the gospel was at stake there in Galatians. And Paul went over there and loved on Peter. 
And he said, brother, you can't shrink back from the Gentiles and gravitate over to the Judaizers who are adding works to the gospel and think that these new converts understand the gospel. You're polluting the gospel by your actions. It's exactly what's happening today. The gospel is being polluted by social justice and critical race theory. And I don't see any Pauls out there who are willing to lovingly come alongside and say that. There are a few. There there are. Um, I appreciate Tom Buck. I I appreciate Pastor Francis uh, down south. I appreciate Tom Ascall. But by and large, <coughs> the culture is unwilling. In fact, they say that Galatians chapter 2 there is uh, an example of racial reconciliation. And we need to reconcile the races That is, folks, listen, we've gone through Galatians verse by verse here on Sunday morning before. That is not racial reconciliation. That is the gospel right there that is at stake. So, David Platt, he calls for white repentance. Mark Dever and Matt Chandler are as woke as they get. And Tony Evans says that Peter was a racist. So I guess the gospel has been, according to them, incomplete for centuries and centuries and centuries since they have not known or we have not known of social justice and critical race theory for so long. Does it not seem illogical? It is. So the cover-up of sexual assaults and the cases that have added up and have simply tarnished the name of Christ within the Southern Baptist Convention, and we've been dealing with this. There was only one hour given to this main subject in the days of dealing with business there. I was saddened about that. It seems that it's been swept underneath the rug. The watching world now, in my opinion, maybe yours too, is now laughing at SBC ethics. I think that they probably lump us into the category of any other liberal denomination who tolerates sexual sin, especially from the clergy. So the name of Jesus has been tarnished and our religion seems spotted. James 1.19 says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God is to keep oneself unstained by the world. And so I'm discontent with the overwhelming majority who are complacent and tolerant of this sin. Thousands of churches are fleeing the SBC because of these same things. So it seems that even the easiest of scriptures are being usurped. 1 Timothy 2.12, but I do not allow a woman to teach or to have exercise, uh, to exercise authority over a man. Very plain, very simple, but yet there is a woman that is leading the committee who is calling for the definition of a pastor. And the reason why this redefining of a pastor is being asked for is so that they can chop it up and make it to where women are also able to be pastors somehow. And so we refuted that. Tom Maskell and Al Mohler, we pushed back on this and said, no, we don't need to have a word study. We don't have a task force to define what a pastor is. We know what a pastor is what a pastor is. And so this liberal push to be able to try and redefine the pastorate is still underway for two years running. Now, it's my recommendation that you agree with our Wednesday night group who have um, already discussed these subjects. It's, It's my recommendation that you agree with those of us who are in the know, who are working, and continue to continue in the word. That's what we're doing here at this church. We're continuing in the word and so proving we're disciples. If this is new information to you, um, it's just simply because they're good at hiding it and it's not readily available to to know. If you don't know about this, um, perhaps I and uh, some of us can help you see uh, where to read the facts and not the by and large glazed over opinions and what's going on. But this pragmatism in the SBC, it's now part of the very fabric of who we are. Not us any longer. But listen, Romans 1.22 says, professing to be wise, they became fools. Pragmatism is simply trying to outdo God and do something that works to get people in the doors and bait and switch and trick them into being Christians. Now, By abandoning the scriptures and being wise in their own eyes, God has given them over to the lust of their own hearts to impurity, Romans 1, 24. And in verse 25, it says, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie 
And in verse 28, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Folks, when you abandon God, God abandons you. This is what judgment looks like. You've heard this. When God removes his blessings off of, whether it's Israel or whether it's a nation or whether it's a person, this is what it looks like. You're just given over to your own demise. And I frankly, am content with being your pastor, with being your shepherd, with making a local difference, with working hard with you folks. We don't need a convention. We don't need a partnership with these folks. There are other conventions to be a part of if we want to. I personally want to lead us towards supporting missions individually. I want to see us gravitate and pull together and take our own mission trips with our own missionaries to go make a difference. For example, we've got the Dale coming next week, a missionary who has given up his life in North Carolina out on the farm. He's taken his wife and his two teenagers to Uruguay, South America, to share the gospel, to plant churches And folks, I'm excited about partnering with our missionaries personally. And you know what could possibly happen? We could get excited about these things. We could get excited about making a difference. The cooperative program, in a way, has made us disconnected from being Great Commission, missionally minded people. We give and give the responsibility to missionaries. But but that's not the Great Commission. The Great Commission is for Christians to make disciples and to baptize them and to go into all nations and to teach them all of what God has commanded us to do. This is for us, and I'm excited to be able to do these things with you. So it's my recommendation that we all unify and stand together and then over the next year of our church life, we would pray together and we would talk together and we would veer in the right direction Together, And so at our next business meeting, we should discuss no longer associating ourselves with the Southern Baptist Convention. Remember, we're not leaving the SBC. They've already left us. They're the ones who left. We're still standing upon the Word of God, and we're going to be faithful with our missions giving and our efforts and redirect it. So we're going to stand for truth. Now, listen to me. I want to, in closing, give you some bullet points as to why this is so important. We can no longer be a part of easy believism for numbers, attractional church worship services, pastoral friendships over sin, shallow preaching series, not absolutely against abortion, um, enabling women pastors, hiding millions, making racial issues worse, ignoring messengers, ignoring polity, having our seminaries polluted with critical race theory, woke initiatives for missions, tolerating heresies and lies and homosexuality. I can't be a part of this. The SBC has already left where we stand. Simply put, the doctrine of God is primary. And when you move God out of the way and you say God needs me, in soteriology or salvations for me to convince someone to make a decision, you have got a wrong view of God. It's God's work wholly unto salvation. And so for our missions to be pouring money into and effort and training into decisionism is simply something that we cannot do. It's a low view of God and it's a high view of self. We cannot capitulate or shrink back at all in regards to the doctrine of God or the doctrine of Christ. You see, critical race theory adds social justice to the cross. It's a false gospel. And when you add works to the atonement of Christ, you're saying the atonement of Christ is not sufficient and Christ needs you. Again, it's a low view of Christ and a high view of self. And again, I've already talked about the doctrine of salvation. And here we see the lust for more bigger church services, bigger buildings, the newest thing led by our SBC culture. It's simply abusing souls for the lust of numbers. We cannot be a part of these tricks and gimmicks. Folks, the doctrine of the church is compromised. It's simply a popularity post. The doctrine of the word is compromised. They use the word to achieve their wants. And so we have so many who are violating church doctrine and not holding fast to it. They lie and they cover things up. They hide millions. They refuse to address homosexuality and yet at the same time endorse it. They so say one thing and do another. They put friendships above God. And by and large, they do not preach 
exegetically. When you take an encouraging series out of the scriptures and you preach the word, okay, I'll give some pastors that. They're preaching the word. But when you take just a few paragraphs or a chapter or something out of the word of God and you just preach that series and you move on to something else, you're not preaching the full counsel of God. You're not preaching in a way that corrects the believers. You're leaving out what preaching is for. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove. When you select a series that's encouraging, right, and edifying and lovely and leaves you feeling good, you're not reproving, you're not rebuking, you're only doing the exhorting. And so preaching is for reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. This is the commandment that's being ignored. And so I'm calling for us to be holy for I'm holy according to 1 Peter 1.16. And 1 Corinthians 15.33 says that bad company corrupts good character. For these reasons, and believe me, many more, I'm no longer going to refer to myself as a Southern Baptist pastor. I'm just simply a biblical pastor. Beulah Baptist Church's pastor. I'm a shepherd that's called to feed the flock. And I'm happy and content in that. So who am I? I'm just a sinner who's been saved by grace, called to preach the gospel and teach the word faithfully, to be a shepherd here at Beulah Baptist Church, which includes praying, preaching, and pastoring. I love my God, I love my flock, and I will not shrink back. Let's pray together. Father, we love you immensely, and I pray if there's anyone who is not saved today, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would draw them to you. Grant them repentance, dear God. May they fall on their face, crying out for forgiveness for the awful things that they've done that has been a violation to you. Lord, thank you for the day that you've granted me repentance. I remember the day of my salvation. I remember the day I cried out for you to save my soul. I remember that you gave that to me, Lord. I remember that you drawled my heart unto you. And Lord, it's your will that none would perish. And so if anyone here has never truly repented, Lord, I'm not asking if they're a, a member of this church. I'm not asking if they've got their plot picked out in their cemetery. I'm not asking, Lord, if they're serving the church. I'm not asking if they have raised their hand and professed to be a believer. I'm not asking, Lord, if they were born into a Christian family. God, I'm asking you to reveal to them whether or not they have truly repented. Have you granted them repentance? Luke 13, 3 says, Lest you repent, you shall likewise perish. Mm -hmm. May we, Lord, forward the true gospel to be truth tellers. We love you and we're standing upon your truth. Thank you for your blessings upon this dear church, God. Thank you for what you're doing here with true salvations and true baptisms and true church membership. God, I pray for all the false converts that have been wrongly led into professing that they believe through perhaps the willingness and the eagerness and the good-heartedness of so many Southern Baptist pastors who have just simply said, say this prayer or raise your hand. God, I pray that you would pull the blinders back from those who do not know you, truly know you, because it is, Lord, the religious crowd whom you have said, depart from me, you doers of iniquity, I never knew you. And so, Father, it's our desire here to continue to share the way, the truth, and the life, to bring light to those darkened souls, to have you illuminate salvation to them, to bring those out of darkness and into your glorious light, and to sanctify the believers and to learn of your word and to be faithful with our gifts. God, thank you for everything that you're doing. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to be strengthened in you, not in ourselves. Help us to be able to discern the spirit of the day, the, the cultural norms that creep into our lives and into our churches. Help us to be able to stand, Lord. Help us to truly peel back an American worldview and even a Southern Baptist Convention view of church and salvation and of you. Help us, Lord, to be biblical is all we're asking. And help, Lord, those who are not saved to be saved. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.